The following teaching is possible thanks to the friends and partners of Spirit and Truth Fellowship International. Welcome again to this, the third feast of Israel, which is the Feast of First Fruits. First one was Passover, second one was unleavened bread, third one is the Feast of First Fruits. Now, the Feast of First Fruits comes right on the heels of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you recall, remember, unleavened bread was one week long. But the very first day, which is the 15th of Nisan, on the 16th of Nisan starts the Feast of first fruits. So we have Passover on the 14th, 15th begins for one week, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So in other words, this Feast of first fruits actually is during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's why sometimes these things can be a little confusing because when you read in the Word of God and you're like, now, wait a minute, if this one starts, how can that one be when this one is going? But actually it is, it, it, the, um, the Passover, literally became kind of the season of Passover. You know how in the Western world we'll speak of Christmas? And someone may say, well, I'm going to a Christmas party over at my brother's. But actually the party's on the 19th. It's really not on the 25th, which is when we celebrate uh, Christ's birth. But it's, well, I thought you said it was a Christmas party. Well, it is a Christmas party. It's during the season or the holiday of Christmas. And so in the same way, they would celebrate the Passover, but it was like there was the preparation for the Passover. There's the Passover itself. There's this, it goes right from Passover right into this uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is for one week. And then during that Feast of Unleavened Bread is the Feast of First Fruits. Now, this is mentioned for the very first time in Leviticus 23 9 through 14. And actually, during this Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, we'll read this, but they were not to celebrate this feast until they entered into the, pass, um, the Promised Land, not the Passover. They enter in the Promised Land. And, you know, so what significance is there in that? Well, remember, the Passover was the sacrifice of the Lamb so that it would protect them from the destroying angel in Egypt. It was a memorial of that. Well, you can't get to the promised land if you don't have Passover first. So there's a significance in that. It's like we too, we're not going to get to the promised land and all the promises that God has for us as his children unless you first accept the Savior, the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, and are cleansed of your sins because of the sacrifice of his blood. And... Um, we get a little bit confused in the West with this Feast of First Fruits, which I think we actually should be celebrating as a memorial to Jesus Christ being the first fruits from the grave, instead of this Feast of Easter. You know, we celebrate Easter, which is really a, a pagan ritual. It's a fertility ri ritual, and, and it, you, we can go into all the, the roots of that. But the true feast that we should be honoring is the Feast of First Fruits. Now, in some years, Easter you know, falls at a particular time. And there's times when the feast of Passover and first fruits is very close to that. And then other years where it moves. The reason being is because in the Western world, we work on a 12 month calendar, whereas the Hebrews, some years it's 12 months, some years it's 13 months. So that again, causes some confusion. But actually, I think the, the more honorable thing, and I think the thing that the first century Christians did is, they actually were celebrating Passovers and unleavened breads and the feast of first fruits. And the reason they would do that is because not that they had to for righteousness under the law, because clearly Jesus Christ was the reality, as Colossians 2.16 tells us, but they could do it as a memorial, just in the same way that we could do it as a memorial. And if we remembered these feasts, we would be being reminded throughout the, the spring and the fall of the plan of redemption of God and the things that Jesus has accomplished and the future things that he's going to do. But back to the Feast of first fruits. now. Let's go to Leviticus 23 and let's look at verses 9 through 14. 
In verse 9, it says, The Lord said to Moses, now verse 10, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you and reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheath of the first grain of your harvest. Now, that grain of the first harvest was the barley harvest. There were two crops in Israel. There's the barley crop and the wheat harvest. There may have been more, but there may have been rye and other things. But those were the two main harvests. And this is a winter um, germination. They plant it in the winter. These crops grow. But the first one to mature is the barley. And the, then once that barley and they get a sheath of that, they're to bring it and it's to be presented before the, the Lord as a wave offering. In verse 11, it says, He is to wave the sheath before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. Now that phrase, the day after the Sabbath, presented a little bit of problem and a little controversy. Because unlike Passover, where we're told that's to be done on the 14th, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread says the, you know, that it's to be celebrated for one week and start on the 15th. So we know that would go from the 15th to the 22nd. But this one just says the day after the Sabbath. But so the question is, what Sabbath? The weekly Sabbath or Passover as the Sabbath? You know, the day after, you know, or what Sabbath are we talking about? Well, the, the rabbis eventually came down and, su and settled this and said, no, this is the 16th. And so we have the 14th Passover, the 15th begins the week of unleavened bread. And during that week on the 16th, they have the Feast of first fruits. As I mentioned, it's the barley harvest. And there is some significance to this because, first of all, the barley is the first one to mature. So I think there's a parallel to that because you will see that this feast is a reference to Christ as the first fruits from the grave. And just as Christ was the first one to proceed ahead of all of the rest, so too the barley was the first one. Um, it About a month later is when the wheat would come into um, the point where it, it could be harvested or start to be harvested. And they actually had, the, the rabbis in the temple area actually had some pretty elaborate systems to make sure that they complied with this. They would have a designated field. They would tend that. They could watch it from the temple area. The priests would, uh, as I say, tend it and watch it to make sure that nothing would happen to damage the crop, to make the crop in any way unclean. And also they would designate a number of sheaths so that they could get the best one and bring that um, and wave it before the, uh, the Lord. There's a number of foreshadow elements in this Feast of first fruits. One of them is that the barley has to endure the harshest of conditions. It's a lot harder uh, growing season for barley than it is for wheat. And in the same way, Jesus went ahead of us and he took the brunt of everything that the devil offered so that he is the first uh, that of all of the, the brothers you know, of all of his brothers and sisters, all of us as children of God, he's the very first that went ahead of us. And he therefore was presented first, just as he said to Mary, don't, don't, don't touch me, I have to go up to the Father. So too, he presented himself first. And also the barley is considered the poor man's harvest. In many ways, Jesus was poor, you know, from a worldly standpoint, he didn't have any material wealth. And also he humbled himself in the, in the sense of poorness in that regard. Um, barley is also the particular way it's winnowed, which means to separate the, the kernels from the stalks, is it's done with rods, it's beaten. And absolutely, you can see the parallel to that where Jesus Christ is beaten. And, um, and as a result of that, you know, we see too that in 1 Peter 2.24, it says, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds, you have been healed. So the wounds of Christ were inflicted with a beating with rods and, and um, he was whipped, we know that. And so in, in the same way, there's a symbolism here about him bearing that for, uh, for us. Then it's brought into the temple. And as I mentioned in John 20, 17, that's where he tells Mary, hey, don't touch me. You know, it can't be unclean. I've got to go up to the Father. So Jesus himself literally did go up and present himself as the first fruits from the grave. 
Another thing that's significant is the the kernels are then ground and they're very finely ground, so they make a very fine flour, removing of all inconsistencies, perfectly presented, almost like it's a perfect loaf, and that's what Jesus Christ was. Uh, he was he's, he was a fine flour, the finest of flour. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23, let's read because we'll see some significance in this. It says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, a reference to the dead. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So you can see the reference in this where Christ literally fulfilled the Passover by shedding his blood. He literally fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread by being bread without sin and being dead bread. And now Christ has literally fulfilled the Feast of first fruits, being the first from the grave. Also, another significant point is that when the barley was presented and accepted by God, it made the whole crop and all the rest of the harvest acceptable. And so too, because of the work of Christ, we, the remaining harvest, are acceptable to God. Um, and then also, the, the, um, the field doesn't do anything to make itself acceptable. It's the first sheath that's presented that makes the rest of the field what we would say kosher or acceptable. And in Romans eleven sixteen and in James 1, 18, it talks about, you know, the rest being acceptable because of the first, um, because of Christ's offering. And it also says in Romans eight twenty three we have the first fruits of the Spirit. So you can see that this feast of First fruits, just like Passover, just like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, has many applications and it actually has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. <music>